Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Dennis, professor of practice at the Institute for Data Science and Computing um, at the University of Miami. And uh, it's my pleasure to, produce today, uh, to introduce today's guest speaker, Gary Jones. So I've worked with Gary in the past uh, for multiple years when I was at the Department of Homeland Security. So I worked in science and technology, and Gary was working on uh, critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. Uh, the names of that changed over, over time. But it's my pleasure to introduce Gary today to give us a guest lecture. Um, Gary is the um, Associate Chief of Strategic Technology at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, one of the newest agencies in the federal government. Um, CISA is the operational lead for federal cybersecurity and the national coordinator for critical infrastructure security and resilience. At CISA, at CISA, Dr. Jones strategizes and provides guidance on the use of innovative and leading edge technologies. So without any further ado, I know Gary's going to regale us with a lot of information. It's going to help us understand where academics like those of us at the University of Miami can bring ideas to the table to help the nation with respect to CISA's mission. So Gary, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you. Yep. Well, thank you for all having me here. First of all, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I've got a lot to explain to my wife uh, right now. Like, why are you spending Valentine's Day in Miami uh, <laughs> while she's freezing up upstate uh, with uh, with with our kids and running them around? I'm like, oh well, you know, it's rough duty, you know, giving a lecture here. And, you know, super warm. What is it, 80 degrees out there? So, um, again, thank you for having me. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background on, on CISA, I know um, Steve gave a little bit on, on that. Uh, you know, our director, uh, Jen Easterly, has been, you know, in the news a lot, saying really great things about, about CISA and some of the work that we're doing. We, we look at ourselves. It's not only just um, the risk advisor on cybersecurity issues, but we, we also look at ourselves as the risk reducer, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we can reduce the risk to any um, agency to you know help with pub public sector, help with academics, um, any any industry regarding you know cybersecurity incidents, and we really want to make sure that that gets across and and that that's part of uh, you know the things that we're we're looking at and and our focus. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the goals on the technology side of of CISA. And, and a lot of times people look at CISA and we, it, it's the operational agency. It means, you know, they're only looking uh, maybe a few hours to, to days, maybe a couple of weeks out um, to, to try to get ahead of things. But th there's also a very a small component in, in CISA that's looking on the strategic side, looking at, um, you know, what can we do within a year, two, three, three years out? Um, you know, how can we get these technologies and and solve our our problems that not only that we have today, but the problems that uh, some of the the new technologies and emerging technologies will will bring for tomorrow. So, um, just kind of going into it, um, it today, like I said, uh, I'll give you a background. What what we've done is we had all these different areas that uh, we had to to look at um, concerning cybersecurity. And it was very, it was an arduous task last year. Uh, one is we were uh, part of a CTO um, in, in CISA and we changed over to uh, a strategy, let's just say strategy and, and uh, policy and plans. And we, we were looking at different topics within that to see how we could help our operational divisions. We have several operational divisions stemming from uh, threat hunting, to uh, incident operations, to um, vulnerability management. And they all have areas or gaps that need to be dealt with, with technology. And, and these emerging technologies can really um, help uh, you know, 
fulfill these gaps and, and uh, actually solve a lot of problems that, that we, we have, but we need to learn how to implement them. And we need uh, smart folks like yourselves uh, to kind of help us uh, along that way. So we developed this, uh, this document called the compendium. It's an R&D compendium, which has basically the breakdown of all the technologies, not all, but the, the high level technologies that we were interested in, uh, as you see, says the concerns. So we'll um, go in here. Um, so what we did, we cross-referenced the research topics to CISA programs. Uh, like I said, the, the CISA divisions. Some of the programs that we're working on are secure by design, um, that it is secure by default, uh, that, that are really some of the AI programs that we're working on, secure AI, and um, SBOM, if, if you're not uh, familiar with that, um, you know, software bill of materials. Uh, that is one of the big areas. I I was having a very intense discussion in the airport uh, regarding SBOM, and I realized it's not the smartest place to talk about SBOM in the airport. Um, <laughs> you, you know, people start to move away from you, and they're like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, yeah, and the SBOM, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and I'm looking around, and like people are starting to really move away. And I'm like, well, okay, I probably shouldn't be mentioning BOM in the airport. So just of just note, if you're talking about SBOM, you might want to just go into some, some place on the side. And then we, we really wanted to, to um, kind of work with uh, the public-private partnership. We want to expand that. And that's why we say we want to inform and suggest possible courses of action. I think when, when uh, Steve and you know, folks asked me to do this, I thought, oh, wow, this is a great opportunity to see where we can, where we can merge here. So when we, what we did was we um, had a, we developed a, this basic kind of heat map chart um, where we, we put importance and urgency. And what are we looking at? What are the technologies? We had about 19 technologies that we looked at over the year. And, and the way I approach it, and maybe it's just my academic background too, is we got to have a research question, right? And they, you know, if, you, if you're in academia, you got to have a research question and go from there. And I said, well, I just don't want us to go out and just explore the technology. What does the technology mean to us and how can we address it? So each of these had, had research areas that we, we, we focused on. And you can see here um, on the, the importance and ur urgency, and you can see some of our most important parts here are, are, are listed above there. The PQC is, is extremely important right now. And the urgency may not be there just yet, but it's getting there. All right, and we'll talk more about, about uh, PQC and the urgency there. And you can see, you know, AI um, for ZTA, ZTA as a, as a whole, and software understanding, which I, I have to kind of go into that because it took me a minute to, to kind of understand what, what that was all about. And then, of course, synthetic data. So the synthetic data part is, is really interesting because the PETS technology, we have the AI um, EO, the AI executive order that came out recently. And we're trying on the CISA side, really trying to address the needs within that. And uh, privacy enhancing technology, which is PETS, um, was one of the areas that was identified within that. And as uh, you know, a cybersecurity agency, with trying to share data, get more um, intense analytics and um, you know, just collaboration, you know, we can't always share our agency data. There's one because, you know, like any, anyone, you don't want embarrassment, right? <laughs> so uh, agencies don't necessarily like us to share their data. So there are parts of it that we may have to, you know, uh, keep secure and then share it. So we're looking at very much privacy enhancing technologies that can roll into the AI framework and AI development, which can help to uh, improve our more predictive and analy uh, analytic models. So that's kind of where we're on there. And of course, LLMs. <laughs> if uh, you cannot have a talk about AI without mentioning LLMs, if you, if you do, you you know you've got way more skill than I do. Um, and it, you know, prompt engineering—that's one of the things. Uh, you know, Web three is actually a, a lot of people don't. Um, you know, especially in our 
in in cybersecurity uh, realm don't necessarily talk too much about Web three and and blockchain. All right. Um, it it's it's hot and then it's cold. It's hot. It's then it's cold. But you know, we had some discussions and we'll we'll go through it where we talk about. using it as a privacy enhancing technology. So now we can still feed that um, AIEO and move out from there. Um, one of the last parts on here, um, which I didn't really touch on in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the talk was the LLM translation of C++ to Rust. And this is where one of the big areas within our um, secure by design area, where it's saying, how can we translate How can we use LLMs for good instead of releasing information? So, and how can we, uh, you know, make our, uh, you know, um, move from these uh, vulnerable, uh, you know, software products that use C and C++, how can we move to more, more things like Rust? Can we use LLMs to program them and, and, and do that? There were some drawbacks and challenges with that, but um, we, we can definitely talk about that offline. So what are the goals? Um, CIS's goals. <laughs> uh, address uh, immediate threats. As I said, we, we are looking at reducing risks to, to, um, to you know, infrastructure, to uh, agencies, to public, private, uh, you know, um, companies, uh, harden the terrain. We want to make it difficult for, for people to, to come in and, and take our information. You know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about quantum. Quantum has this big thing going. You know, we, we're talking about harvest now. You're harvesting that, harvesting that information. You may not be able to decrypt it now, but when a um, uh, cryptographically relevant quantum computer comes online, you can decrypt it. You can break a lot of that uh, the public key encryption that, that's available today. Um, so it, it, we are, we're trying to make sure that that doesn't um, happen. And then, of course, drive security to scale. Make sure that, you know, from the, the mom and pop all the way to, you know, the big agencies, everyone's important in that. And I think that's where the secure by design comes into play. I think you saw where we're talking about SBOM and SCRM, um, uh, supply chain risk management. So we have a big uh, project going with SBOM right now. Um, To, to try and develop uh, technologies to support SBOM. We uh, talked about vulnerability management, being able to understand and look and find vulnerabilities very quickly and address them. That's the biggest thing for, for CISA. How can, we, how can we find that? How can we predict it? And what can we do to, to, um, to uh, address it? So as you'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll have, you know, we, we partner with NIST on the CSF, the um, cybersecurity framework, you know, um, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, all those things are, are part of what we're looking for. Excuse me. Um, AI security, of course, you know, we'll get into a little bit more about that. That's a, that's a big, big uh, part of it, threat analysis. And of course, you know, secure by design and secure by default is all part of that. So that's our focus areas as far as CISA is concerned. And then our goals are on top. So some of the research areas where you guys are really here for, right? <laughs> um, so make sure, okay, thought I hit it twice. See, I'll, I'll, I'm still um, worried about what my wife's gonna say about me here. So I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm a, what excuse can I come up with? Um, so <laughs> LLMs, right? Uh, We we all know about these large language models. They have they have the good, they have the bad, they have the ugly with it, right? And um, a lot of times, how can it, in from I have to look at it from the CISA perspective. What is the threat, right? How can we how can we use these effectively without them becoming a threat? As you know, with these la large language models, whatever you put in becomes you know part of that model. So I and and in from the government perspective, that's not a great thing to have, right? Because some of the information that we put in there or even use um, can become part of that language model, which now becomes a threat. Some of those prompts are 
you know, as we go through prompts, as you go deeper and deeper into it, you start to release too much information. And we have a big problem with that sometimes. We want to make sure our analysts don't release information. I, I often you know, say that this is, is basically speed dating, right? You, you know, you don't want to be sitting there <laughs> talking about, you know, oh, well, you know, I had this corn on my foot or whatever else. That's TMI, you know, you, you're, you're a little too deep into things that, um, so you don't want to release so much information. You want to release enough information that you get the, the information that you need. Right. Uh, without compromising the government sensitive information. So we're having a big problem with um, how can we how can we uh, get these large language models under control? Uh, you know, we, 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 it talks about privacy, bias and ethical concerns. As we as we know, there's there's hallucinations that come out from from la large language models. And do we use that information? The bias inherent, you know, I, we've got a bias that we, we can't deal with. A lot of people talk about bias, but they forget about variance. And, and you know, the bias is in there, but you can control the bias, but in, in the, the, oh, we want no bias in there. Well, good luck. The variance will be all over the place, right? So <laughs> you, be, um, you have to be able to put those controls in place so that you get a little bit of both and you're able to control um, things like that. So I think we, we have basically um, so, and I think, you know, the need to understand the model uh, used for applicability, that's one of the most important statements there, All right? We, we need to understand from the government side how these models can be applied um, securely uh, so that we don't uh, release information. How can we control those parameters so that we uh, uh, have that bias, but so that it's, it's enough that we can say, oh, well, this data is biased, but then we can use this piece of data to balance that data and, and start going from there and, and, and understanding our models better and, and securing our models a lot better. So I, I think that's, that's one of the biggest areas that we have. As you see, the, the LLMs announced over the, over the past couple of years, I mean, it exploded, I would say, 2023 or 2022, 2023 was, was the, the explosion, right? Um, you know, when chat GPT came online, they've been around for a long time. I mean, uh, Siri, <laughs> you know, I tried to tell people Siri was there and, you know, and, and the people are like, Oh, really? Yeah. Siri is, uh, you know, it's not as big as like chat GPT or anything, but you know, the, it had, you could ask Siri a question and it'd tell you, right. It, you know, Actually, think sometimes Siri is a little bit more reliable than than some of these others. <laughs> so, okay. yes, sir. How do you, how do you, with the emergence of the open source LLMs, how do you, how do you control some of these things? Like the chat, chat is closed, and you know, Gemini is closed, Google's, uh, but like Llama is completely open, right? And, and Mistral is completely open. Yeah, so that's where we need the help from. Yeah, we need the help to make sure that if if companies are being generated that can develop closed models where you know we can we can use them and and not have to worry about somebody well let's just say other countries other nation state actors becoming part of that model to take that information and use it someplace else so we need we need closed models that we can use within the government to so that we can we or or we need very forgetful models of prompts you know when you ask me a question i'll go oh, i don't remember what that was i'll give you an answer but then i don't remember two seconds later right so i mean that's that's something that we can do for 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 that as well um oh yes how much do you share with other countries that is so we do share i i mean you know sharing is caring right we do we care we we, we exactly so we share with the people we care for um for allies we share you know there's um you know i was just at a five eyes conference and you know we share i you know i gave a, a quantum brief I, you know we we share our ai goals we share um certain things you know we collaborate with the countries if they're willing to collaborate and and make sure you know we we have our our little consortiums but you know i i don't get too much in, into the international sector but when they ask for for sharing or technology briefing 
I, I will gladly work on that. But we do share information with, with various other countries, um, especially our five, five eyes partners. Um, there's, you know, other countries that uh, we, we, we get information, not get information from, but just collaborate on, on, on techniques for cybersecurity. Because yeah, there it's just a it's better to to understand because you know we have one landscape here, right? It's it, although it's very dynamic, but they have a different landscape, and so it's it, you know with them it's we're able to see oh well maybe that land that that technique can be applied here or something like that. So we do share on that side. Okay, so I, as I talked to you guys about the prompt engineering part, right? Um, it, it just interacting with, with these large language models is a, is a science in itself, right? Um, and asking certain questions and then asking it a different way can, can produce different results. They're very probabilistic in, in, in terms. So, uh, you know, this is where the hallucinations may start. You know, we don't know, right? Where, how do we know? Because there, there's, there's, uh, papers that are being published about, how what types of large language models generate um you know hallucinations more and so it, but how is it how is it really measured right so you have the the prompts if it, if you have a poorly written prompt you will get a pro, poorly written answer you know it's like a bad question I, although i say is no bad questions if you if you ask me you know um you know how's miami i'm going to tell you great but really, you're, you know, I, you're going to, you say, no, I, it's great to me. I left from snow. See, that's what I'm saying. So my, from my perspective, it's great, you know, um, because I'm in, a, I'm in short sleeve shirt. I have, you know, I had to go dig deep in my, uh, my stuff to pull out my summer clothes. Cause I, I, you know, I had winter coat and everything on. So it's great from that perspective, but you, you, you know, it, what you're asking for is, you know, uh, what are the main things that you've done today in, in Miami to make it great, right? So you just asked me, how was Miami? I'll tell you, it's great. You know, but what, what made it great? Okay, well, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's a whole different thing. Or what makes Miami good? What makes Miami bad in your perspective, right? So it, it, again, it's a perspective thing. So it's a prompt that you may not, you may not um, be able to, to fully fully, uh, you know, get from it. So again, the prompt engineering, the LLM, uh, with prompt engineering training, um, getting the, the right uh, prompts in there without releasing sensitive information. So that's one of the main things we have to look at for our, our analysts. And I, I wanna make sure that, that this really gets over because this is a huge area for us to help with that trustworthy, more trustworthy AI. I, I don't think AI is the, the, the part that's, untrustworthy it's the the users <laughs> are untrustworthy right and and the developers that they don't know I, I mean a lot of times when we develop something we just develop it because we're, we you know especially when i was developing you just want to make it work you don't care about the security of it you're like oh it worked done see ya and and you're you're out right but i i i've, I've seen that you know people don't develop to it with the intention of being used bad badly or or the or with you know malintent they just want to be able to make something they just want to be able to change the world you know and and that's what these these things are so we got to be careful how we say that these things are not good and and you know really kind of put ourselves into a bind yes sir um, what would be an example of a well written uh Props that would minimize security risk and bias, but at the same time still be useful. To Ooh, man, that's deep. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring an example of that one. So, <laughs> but I would say something that um, answers a question, right? Um, does not use, you know, as much lend itself to a stereotype, right? Um, I, I think that would be one way because, you know, they might say, um, and I got to be careful on this because it's being recorded, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, why are dogs, you know, stupid? And people would say, no, dogs are not stupid. It, the, the LLM will answer you that question, right? But 
I think the real question is, why don't dogs understand uh, human language? And then it would be something like, like that. But they do understand parts of human language, right? And I don't know if this is a great prompt or not, but I'm just trying to make something up on the fly, so stay with me. Um, and uh, But that, that right there is where you, when you've asked the questions, you've asked, why are dogs stupid? You've already put a bias in there because the question is implying that dogs are stupid, which they're not. They're, they're you know, pretty intelligent animals. You know, I've had girlfriends that are, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously. Just kidding. I, oh, please make sure you delete that part. <laughs> no, but um, it, it, did I answer your question? Do you, do you see what I'm talking about as far as like, you don't want to ask a bias prompt, right? In that case, like garbage in, gar garbage out principles still apply? Yes. Yes. And, and as I tell Steve, I use rubbish. I'm from a British colony, so I got to say rubbish. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cyber physical system. So this is actually, um, are you, is everyone familiar with the PCAST board? Uh, the PCAS board is actually um, the presidential appointees for, for uh, cyber physical systems. So they're, they're looking, they actually I was on one of the subcommittees and they were looking for a way to um, help uh, cyber, you know, um, reduce risk on cyber physical systems. And that that ties right into our critical infrastructure mission that that CISA is very um, CISA is, is actually the, the leader on that. And so the Colonial uh, Pipeline was one of those those uh, those incidents where, you know, gas prices, I they couldn't mow my lawn. You know, for for a while there, and uh, the the Colonial Pipeline was one of those areas that we we were looking at. and said, you know, and, and the question here is, what should the federal government be doing in this space to encourage more resiliency? Again, it's just those critical infrastructures, and when 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 critical infrastructure is built, like like say the the pipeline and electrical and water and things like that. They're built with just do the job, right? Security is not the 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 main thought in there. Just do the job, and that's what that's what we get. And we need, uh, you know, to set goals uh, for federal policy and standards. We need to implement standards that when these things are built, that they're built with security in mind. It's a you know, it's time back. Secure by design is such a great initiative. I, I usually don't all hop on the bandwagon and things, but that is that it, it's such a great initiative because all these things can be built more securely to to um to help with with critical infrastructure. And I think that you know, in in our sense, we need um academics. We need uh industry to help us to to kind of push this forward. So uh, I think this is one of the areas that we really need to help. And this is not necessarily so much on the technical aspect. This is more on the policy aspect, I think, with with standards. And there's some R&D investment as well. But I think we need to, to, to get the standards and policy in place with this one. SATCOM. So we saw you what happened with uh, in, in Ukraine. Right when the 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 satellite communications are attacked, right? So it, we saw you know Russia's capability to to do that. They're not great at the ground war, but they're they're okay at the at the satcom area. Um, so you know what else can be done to to do this? So I I'm actually sitting on a IEEE um, you know uh, satellite communications uh, committee, and I had learned so much. You know, there are so many pieces to to satellite communications. I mean, there's the ground, there's the air, there's you know, there's the weather, there's um, things that you just cannot. Uh, I mean, it, there's integration with so many different elements that that drive um, satellite communications. I mean, you see the end users there, right? And we're using that. Very exciting project here with NASA, which was featured in Forbes. That Stephen and I and a few others are involved. A secure uh, nanosatellite communications space. Wow. Using blockchain, 
Really? Yeah. See, that that's that's my idea. It, it, is it is I'm glad that you know these technologies need to start being a little bit more combined. We need to start seeing where the the intersections are, right? Because Emergency. Yeah. The big scale solutions require several technologies to work together. Right. Exactly. I mean, it, th this this is one of those that really illustrates that because you see the mobile, the 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 uh, the planes, the 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 uh, the cars, the everything else in 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 that right, and then the going to the satellite, and then the operations center. I, I was amazed. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, yes. And there's so much technology that goes in there and there's so much protection. As I always say, we go from the protection side. We go from the risk reducing side. Yes, there are, there are other, other perspectives, but you know, I have to come from the CISA side that looks at how do we make sure that none of these really fall victim to what happened in Ukraine or anything else, all right? So we gotta make sure that we're, we're protecting that. So we're designing, uh, networks, you know, secure ways to send information, encrypted ways to send information to satellites so that satellites are more protected. How can we make sure our satellites up there are more protected? Because as we saw, you can, you can blind a satellite, right? Um, and, and there's, there's technologies out there that can blind a satellite. What are the defenses that we can use to help to defend our, our SATCOM um, networks? So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on out there with the, um, coming from the traditional SATCOM to more the, the mesh uh, SATCOM uh, architecture and what other architectures can we, can we implement to make it more secure? PQC, one of my favorites, right? Um, <laughs> this is post-quantum cryptography. Uh, so as you know, with, if you don't know, I'm going to let you know. Um, our you know, public encryption is in danger if a cryptographically relevant quantum computer comes online. That means it's an error-correcting quantum computer. It will be able to run uh, you know, Shor's algorithm, Right, and that will break the the public key in, in cryptography. Right, Shor's algorithm is a factoring algorithm, and that's what our public key is based on. And it will be able to break that. It will be able to break most of the the public key encryption. There, one that's not shown on here is Grover's algorithm, but it, there's significantly more com computational resources that would be needed to run Grover's algorithm, which could break some metric uh, keys. So this is. Shor's algorithm is more on the asymmetric side, and then um, uh, Grover's is more on the symmetric side, which can can become a problem. But NIST is working on the the PQC um, resistant algorithms. If anyone says PQ uh, quantum quantum safe, they're they're pulling your leg. That's a hallucination in itself, right? Because there's nothing that's safe. It's just like classical al algorithms. There will be a need to move to other. Um, more secure algorithms. So we have to be prepared. So crypto agility is one area that we need to look at, all right? How do we, how do we make our systems more crypto agile as we go to different al algorithms? The other part is, um, as, we, as we look at that, is the, what happens when we do switch over to quantum resistant algorithms? How will our classical or leg legacy systems be able to communicate? What operational impact will that have? Are there hybrid technologies that we can use? You know, people have talked about QKD and quantum key distribution as part of that hybrid structure. Can that be used? You know, NSA is not in favor of it, but you know, there's, there's some applications to it. What applications can we have there? So there's a lot of work that can be done in this um, CRQC, uh, in, in this post-quantum, uh, realm. So just know that we hopefully get the, those brilliant minds uh, going and, and see the opportunities for us to, to work together. Uh, we're developing right now, you know, we're developing an a automated cryptographic inventory um, strategy to uh, show that, hey, you know, you're going to need, we can go to automation, but we're going to need a little bit of still that human element in there to kind of show that ground truth and how much of the human element do we need, right? So there's there's a whole bunch of areas that we can talk to, and 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 quantum is 
you know, it's not just it, quantum is the umbrella term, right? But there's all these other areas that we can we can look at to to coordinate and to make more resilient as we go along. Just a question on that. Um, what what do you what would you suggest is the urgency level of this? Is are we looking at it's going to be your best guess. So, so the way I always answer this question is uh, CISA is planning, is doing our plan off of 2030. Okay. That's in, in 2030 is, is where we, we, pl we plan off of. All right. Um, if you're familiar with Mosca's timeline, our information that is leaking out right now is already, you, you can say it's gone, right? Because if, if somebody comes online, they're going to, they're, they're going to take it. They're, they're going to be able to decrypt it. We have um, Mosca's timeline. We have information leaking out. We have things that, that are, you know, that we have to really be careful of on the, the 2035 time frame, right? So anywhere between 2030, 2035, we've got to we've got to really be careful of. Okay, so if you're planning, it's anywhere between there that we're 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 planning on. Yeah, because the 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 stuff that we were looking at data data life cycles that that make sure that they're they're not you know relevant. So if you're doing anything crazy. I'd stop doing it right now and wait till we, <laughs> you know, later. And then you just, you go from there, but that that's basically where we're, we're looking at planning out from, from there. Yes, sir. So uh, uh, what about the coordination, right? So the 2030, right? Mm -hmm. so we will have a size of something right? that can be sort of a deployable, but, but then the coordination with other countries, so, so, so yes, so we are, right? we, is it, it, that, so is it needed for the other allies? So yes, the same level? Oh. so that is a great question. So that's one of the questions I asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, no, they, the, the thing is, yes, because if, if the other countries decide to go on their own, you know, uh, quantum resistant algorithm, they don't follow the NIST algorithm, then we have a problem. We can't communicate, right? And then we have to use these hybrid or whatever technologies, which can be more susceptible to security incidents. So we are talking to other countries and we are having a lot of coordination. Um, I was just in uh, Brussels and talking with the EU about their quantum and seeing, trying to see where they're gonna um, be at. They're spending a lot of money on QKD, which is interesting because the infrastructure needed for QKD is quite robust, and so that that could um, impact things very very quickly. So yes, all the other countries. I think there's only one country that I know of that may not use the NIST um, algorithm, and you know we we pretty much know who that is, right? <laughs> um, one of the one of our bigger countries, uh, not so friendly. So um, that they, they may not use the NIST algorithm for for that yeah and then, like i said those those algorithms are are only safe until they're broken <laughs> now zero trust so ai we want to try to integrate ai and zero trust and i got a few minutes so i'm, I'm going to try to push it through here a little bit um you know th this is as you see on here we try to uh look at how we can use ai to help supplement you know, data, uh, you know, where, and, and, and going off of the pillars of, of, of zero trust, if you guys are familiar with 800-207, that's a zero trust um, publication from NIST. Um, they, they tell you what are the different pillars. And we look at, you know, the, the identity, the data, the network, and, and so on. Um, and we're looking to see how we can optimize, uh, use AI to optimize network, AI to optimize data, AI to optimize access. So I think there's there's definitely ways to um, to do that, you know, uh, so that we don't have, um, so that you know it's not just zero trust and we have all these all these pillars on the side and we have nothing to really 
Um, they're, they're, they're trying to generate all these technologies that don't incorporate AI, but we can't, we can't really communicate with them. I think the, the AI for zero trust architectures is, is one of our better ones. Cause as you see the ICAM up there, you know, how do we verify the ID? How do we get the access to the policy decision, which gives you the access to the data, to the resources and, and so on. So how can we better do that? Um, to, to actually generate something of a um, AI and zero trust model. So implementing that and optimizing that, that, that coordination. Uh, I have not seen, I mean, I, I know some companies already say that they have zero trust. Uh, I haven't seen it. You know, I, I've seen a lot of, of, of talk about zero trust, but I haven't seen it really implemented and I haven't seen it on a large scale. So, I think AI on a large scale will help to do that um, so that it can, it can, you know, make this architecture a little bit more um, scalable than what we see on the smaller sense. And then we, we talked about zero trust and you can see where, where it is here, um, where we talk about the, the pillar, the, the data, uh, you know, breaking down the different data, the access, the categorization, all those things. I think AI can really help in that um, in, in device, it, it, that other pillar where, where we're talking about devices, seeing the devices, being able to uh, um, tell you if the behavior is crazy, right? Because zero trust is based on the access. That's one of the first pillars in, in our identity. And, and then so that'll help us better understand, is somebody really doing something that is not, do we have another Edward Snowden on our hands? You know, um, how do we, how do we make sure that, that, that they're in compliance? How do we make, make sure that they, they've got the training? Why are they trying to access this data that they shouldn't be accessing because their job is only this, this type of data, right? And that's where, and, and, and if there's changes, And I think this is really where AI can really help. If there's changes, dynamics, you know, they get a promotion or something like that, that, that can be changed very quickly and then access to another pool of data. So I think that's where things really, um, really where we can, we can go with here. One of the last uh, parts here, software understanding, right? So this one... <laughs> I was I was a little hesitant with this one at first when they when they brought it to me. They're like, you know, uh, the government doesn't really understand the complexity of software. And I was like, well, that is freaking rude. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, hey, you know, that's one of those that you're stupid, but you know, whatever. Um, so I I, I looked at that and I was like, um, okay. And when I I thought about it in a sense that, yeah, we are implementing so many different pieces of software into our networks. And how are we keeping track of, does anyone know what this software does after a while? Does anyone know that it has like back doors or anything? Is anyone tracking it, monitoring, whatever else? We just buy the software. Oh, it, you know, it, it turns on the lights, okay. Yeah, but it may turn on light and shut off the, the AC at the same time. Oh, well, guess what? We Oh, you know what? The AC keeps going off. Okay, um, let's buy another piece of software to turn the AC on. So every time the one software turns off the light, the other one turns on the AC. So we, yeah, we're fixed. All right, but we got some other stuff going on there and it's a battle, you know? And so, and, and we start, you know, just buying software to, to, to patch, to, to, you know, we're patching software, but we're patching ourselves at the same time. So the understanding of, how things are just kind of widening. Like our, our software, as, as you see, as we got more complicated towards the, the early 2000s, um, you know, we, we were still, we didn't get really trained on that. We just know how to, how to, to, to click a button and, and that's it, In, install and walk away. And that was one of the things I said, okay, well, I will, I, I think that is actually because What happens is when we do that with critical infrastructure, who knows what we've put in there, right? And that's one of the areas that we really have to look at is 
how do we look at our critical infrastructure, know that we put the right software in there and be able to say, you know what, it's software A that's really causing the problem and how do we fix that, all right? So last one is the, the, the synthetic data. This is the pets, right? This is, this is uh, my pet project, huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> privacy enhancing technology, right? Uh, so synthetic data is one of the biggest areas that I feel can really support a lot of CISA's um, you know, missions. Because we, we do want to share data. We want to share data with countries. We want to share data with industry. And of course, we want to share data do it with academics, right? But how do we share it and not cause drama, right? Uh, so our, our 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 deal is to generate that that have that real data, generate that synthetic data, and share the synthetic data so that you can do analytics on it and give more more of a predictive analysis on there. But synthetic data with anything, it's statistically based. We all know about statistics, right? It goes up and down. And then you, you can have where um, it's, it's really good synthetic data because it's, it's really well based off of it. It doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, uh, you know issues with it. And it's, it's, it's a good representation of that, that real data. But then there's also that synthetic data that's not so good that will give you the incorrect, um, you know, solutions. So we want to generate more uh, real synthetic data that is not giving away um, the traits, the, the secrets of, of that thing. So that's where I think for us, as you see the quality and privacy tests, that is one of the biggest, I should have probably bold that right there. Cause that's really what we're looking at is, is it, does it need a correction All right, or, or feedback or anything like that? So we want to, to do that and, and be able to, to generate synthetic data. So CAPM, is our cyber analytic uh, uh, platform for machine learning. We're actually working with, um, uh, it's a three cloud, uh, yeah, let me, let me start, CAPM, yeah, so the, the cyber analytic platform, but it has the uh, commercial cloud and it has a government cloud, right? And so the gov cloud is where we work um, on, the, on the government agency side, we don't share, right? But the commercial cloud side, is, is, is actually three clouds, I believe it's AWS, Google, and Microsoft. And, and so we're, we're looking to, to get the, the data that we work on this side over to, to this side, where our commercial side, where um, academia can have access to it. Um, uh, public, any, any public can have access to this so we can work together and develop uh, great predictive analytics for it. So I think that's, that's where we, we look at and, and really want to kind of push uh, that collaboration on that CAPM side and bring people in and, and be able to share that data uh, using synthetic data. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so how is synthetic data uh, created in the first place? Is that based on real world data? Yeah, it's based on, so uh, there, there, there could be real world data. Most of the time it's real world data. And I, I think I, I show it here that you can have uh, uh, just a data generation that's close to what, what you need. And then you have the synthetic data. Then you put in the real samples in there to kind of really make it a little bit better. Um, so you can actually put it on the, the other side as well. Um, to, to make it a little bit more, a little closer to what the real, the real data is, and then go on and do a quality test to see if it is still useful. Because once you put in that, that, once you generate that, a lot of times this synthetic part, I might be a little bit wrong, the synthetic part is generated off of the real data. So that's kind of where it starts. Um, the Web3, really quickly, like I said, on the, on the privacy enhancing technology, I think that's where um, blockchain really needs to look at is, is setting that circle of trust, right? And, and having that circle of trust and being able to share that data um, and, and maybe even share that data at just without the synthetic data, right? So if you, if you have a trusted blockchain, that's where you can, you can really um, uh, set up. And, and I think it, it can be used as a privacy enhancing technology if everyone can 
uh, maybe just when you get the analytics within the blockchain to send it out to the other blockchain, that might be where synthetic data might be used. But this is a great opportunity for, for privacy enhance, enhancing technologies, getting, um, setting up a blockchain, setting up that trusted network and being able to uh, share. So uh, it, it could be between CISA, you know, some, some academic institutions, some, some large private industry or small private industry and maybe start just having that little consortium to to get some analytics working there that they can just share amongst each other so that they can get better ideas out of that so uh, that's just um some of the stuff that we're we're looking at and and um you know trying to trying to have uh folks kind of start thinking about it as more of a pricing enhancing technology in in that sense and that's basically it uh you know We had 19 topics. I, I think I only briefed like 10 of them. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the high level ones and ones I thought that were really ones that could be used and applied to academics. Uh, if, if you need to contact me, I'm the, the CISA Office of Strategic uh, Strategy Plans and um, uh, Policy. And that's my name. It's, it's I, I know I introduced myself as Gary, but there's good reason Garfield is just you know there, there's too many questions that go along with that so <laughs> um, so that's that's who i am and you know i would be happy to work with anyone and talk to anyone um you know after this so any questions <laughs> thanks all right how do i uh um that was a fantastic talk thank you very much um One of the, um, I guess one of the questions I have is, is a lot of these processes are very computationally intensive and therefore very energy intensive. Mm -hmm. Is there ever, are there ever situations where you're assessing a technology based on the energy required to run those processes? So I'm, just, I'm just thinking of blockchain, for example, or other, yeah. other processes. Just, it, just, it requires so much energy that it wouldn't be useful in specific applications. I think that's that's one of those questions that is more on the um, on the operational side, right? And you know, I think about that in in the sense of you know, I actually have a, a talk on HPC and you know, having use cases and being able to use um, our I, I guess our clusters, our supercomputers, more efficiently and effectively. Um, we do think about the energy that's that's going to go on with that i think that that breeds itself into better developed use cases for it um so you know if if because our knowledge of these you know energy efficient processes are not there right we were getting there right but we don't have a hpc expert we don't have you know supercomputer or or anything like that um but we we are trying to get to that that part where we're using um the, where we're tying in uh use cases that can be better be used with high performing computers and and you know less energy on on um you know sucking sucking stuff out of our building that is uh you know we're trying to link computers together it it might not be a good fit but we're trying to that's why we're trying to work with with public private partnerships to get a better idea of how to use the resources that are out there any other questions Nope. Uh, how much of this threat does acceleration is in uh, OS? Um, a huge threat. Yeah, a huge threat. When you say acceler accelerationism, are you talking about accelerationism of technology or? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, I think mainly technology and then what would be some other examples? Um, so I, I'm a technology guy, so I would, I would just think technology, but I, I would say that, you know, how fast technology has been moving is, is, is our, our biggest problem because uh, a lot of times in, we have, um, an idea of, yes, this is, it, it's like, okay, when I was at, I first came back to to CISA and I was trying to say, you know, I think quantum is going to be an issue because from what I'm hearing, 
yeah, especially on the academic side, it's becoming an issue. And, you know, everyone is, is, is tied into their, their, their side and, they, and don't want to, to really come in there. And, and what they don't see is this thing is going really, really fast over here. And, and until it hits something, then you're like, oh, my gosh, what happened there? And then now we're, we're trying to, to catch up to it. It's the same thing with LLMs. LLM has been around for a while, as you can see from the from the graph. And but until Chat GPT hit something, and people were like, "Ooh, what?" <laughs> That's the only way it 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 comes apart. If it doesn't make it on the national stage, it's usually not looked at, right? It, it's very hard to convince. You know, we're all kind of. Um, I'd, I'd say children of Congress, right? Because we all look for that money from, from Congress. And if they don't believe it's, it's supposed to be funded, you know, we can't, we, until it hits that wall, we can't, um, we can't get the funding to, to do that. We can try to bring attention to it, but, you know, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, quantum is going to come around in five years. And they're like, okay, yeah. But until it hits something that says quantum is here, or is going to be here in the next year, you know. Uh, and and I'm not saying anything bad about Congress. Lord knows I'm a government worker, and um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that we as, as people don't see that speed until there's an accident. I have a question. Then. Yes, sir. I have some kind of concern, but I hope that I'm wrong. That perhaps the the grower part of the of symmetric, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. There is a possibility that nothing can be done, but I'm not sure. In other words, you speed up search, and whatever you do for symmetric people, what well, you can see search, right? I mean, the, I'm the ice for the brute force search, right? Yeah. So yeah, therefore, basically. Well, it, it, so maybe it's is, is it that then it's limited? No, no I'm not saying it, it's of course very important because so, the, the the other part, the the public, right? The, yes. Not symmetric. So is it is it really that it's only the post quantum is only for public key right or now the 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 focus is only for public key right now All right it's not for for symmetric right now All right because we got the 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 main portion is that shores can be run yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, actually i think you know in a classical sense it can be run but it, it would take a long time um the the problem is when it's on a quantum computer it takes a much shorter time and i could be could be wrong you have quantum experts here but yeah, yeah. the the thing i would see is that if grovers does come online and you, we do have a crqc um i would see that our our encryption would be the I mean, I, I was thinking about this the other night. It's so funny you said that. What do we do if 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 we do get there? I think our our encryption becomes a lot more dynamic. Our keys become longer. You know, things things are are because now you've got the longer keys. You've got the quantum computer with the longer keys. Grover still has to search, right? So by the time it gets to the 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 um to that key length. You know, we we might have changed it already. So there's 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 possibility of getting more dynamics with it, and that's just my take on it. You know, I I don't know if it's if it, if that is anything feasible, but that would be my thought. Yes, yeah, so don't, don't just confirm what I was thinking. So so I, I should correct myself when I said nothing can be done. Well, of course you can have a bit larger key. Yeah. Well, Grover actually mm -hmm. brute force search much faster. Right. And therefore, oh well, of course I'll just use a, a larger, larger key. key. Yeah. So maybe I, I, what I really should have said, well, maybe nothing can be done against Grover other than just well use much larger keys. Yeah. But but in the in the non asymmetric ones, one could really introduce new algorithms that mm -hmm. would not be and and and, and, and right and, and and of course there's this other issue that I did not mention, but yeah, I appreciate you to mention it. That of course uh, you, you you just mentioned it that um, well shores speeds up much much more than growers yeah so yeah so that that's also right that, but that's on the factoring side yeah not yeah, not to serve right right so right. this this also gives a reason so two, two reasons why to concentrate on mm -hmm. shore rather than grower exactly first, first shore actually is much more dangerous because yeah. it speeds up um exponentially or whatever exponentially and, and grovers and is quadratically yeah that, that for for grover well just just increase the key so it's the solution is not 
I mean, it's, it's just maybe we already know what the solution is. Just to use larger case. Yeah, and and it, maybe you know people are. I I think that was one of the the solutions when I was reading about it a long time ago was that we we lengthen the the keys. But that's that's ex exactly what I was. I I mean that's that that would be my first thought. Yeah, I'm not even sure something much more can be done. Right? I, I, I don't I'm think so. That. But I would never correct Elena's Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just guessing. Yeah, with yeah. I have a question. Actually, we have um, a distinguished guest here, Dr. Eddie, who is on our board, and he's working on an interesting uh, problem for securing hospitals. He's an emergency room dog and uh, trying to so who is modernize <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not distinguished, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't realize that you just said that I, I somehow didn't listen that he, he's actually here, right? Yeah. This part I missed. Mean, this part of what it's... Um, so uh, we had a great discussion yesterday uh, and... Um, I brought an issue of Louis Gillard, maybe he didn't can articulate the problem he's solving for emergency or for emergency patients and things like that. And I think it has implication in the public safety, not as a very touch basis of the room. So maybe I think you can in a little bit talk about what you have and maybe there is synergy here and maybe we can join forces in terms of pushing uh, some interesting uh, projects together. Mm -hmm. Sure, so I, I think in, in short and you know, if we need more detail, I'm happy to dive in. But in short, we're we're trying to coalesce large data packets of telemetry data, specifically EKG. I'm a physician, by the way, so specifically EKG data. Mm -hmm. um, very large, very large packets, just because it's continuous data sourced from several leads on any given patient, right? Okay. Uh, and so we're trying to coalesce that data from different or disparate sources, sources right? yeah. in this case, branches, different uh, different hospital branches within a larger system, mm -hmm. right? Co coalesce them, aggregate them into, you know, a different, um, you know, uh, user interface, right? Uh, which will then be, uh, which will then allow one individual to have access to the entire enterprise's so data, right? That has implications on how you manage the alarms yeah. that uh, are generated from the arrhythmias from 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 these systems, hmm. um, and so I think I think Elena was was talking about how th there's there's a parallel here to you know other types of alarming yeah alarm so management right. I mean, right, right right yeah so CDM. I, you know, I was talking earlier um, at lunch about CDM, our Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program. And if you look that up, that is very risk-based. Um, it, it, it basically brings in several different feeds from several different agencies to uh, to give somewhat of a risk score or risk um, prediction. So, so that is that is some way that you know I'm I'm just kind of thinking of of how your your uh, you know bringing all that, uh, right. aggregating all that together, that might be um, a way to to do it because there are there are programs out there that it does. I, I think we used to call it the cop uh, back in the day, you know, common operating picture um, where something like that would be be useful. I just I just typed in your turn rate. It went to the CISO website. So, yeah. Uh, no, but I think I think the interesting part was that like obviously telemetry data is real time data mm -hmm. so it requires very timely interventions, right? Like so, if you for instance have you know a high risk arrhythmia or malignant arrhythmia, like let's say VFib, like, yeah, fibrillation, you can't wait minutes, like let alone the next day a sort of storm for mm -hmm. type of model. So I think that's what we were getting at. So it's very you were actually you were yeah, it's that. very close to incident yeah. handling. So it's very close to incident handling. Of course, I don't know what you said. The V, whatever you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm a whole other doctor. <laughs> yeah. There are two things that uh, Eddie can do. He can transfer technology possibly from CISA, which is great thing to do. Yeah. I've done it before. It's great, but we get like a license from the government. Or if the technology doesn't exist in the government and it's synergistic and, and, and kind of will use, then we can try to get some government funding to de co develop it together because Eddie has a medical application. But what he described the problem is that this problem is, is, is horizontal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's a very, that's, that's a problem that, 
was very um apparent in the in the cybersecurity community right because we had our we have our alarms we have our alerts that that go off certain behaviors things like that certain signatures things that 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 set off our alarms and that's interesting that you say from that perspective because we may not be able to to um you know give you port all the art all the uh the tools to you because they may not do the same thing but the architecture i think would be interesting in the in the sense of how you can bring different disparate tools together to um inter uh interoperate to provide that so i think there's 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 um opportunity there Yeah. Cool. So Gary, maybe as a parting comment, you could talk to the students and faculty and say, you know, how they might prepare themselves to interact with CISA. Nice, Steve. Fellowships or they whatever. Have people their life insurance because the world is ending, right? <laughs> I, I just read the news yeah. right, saying Russians are sending nuclear weapons to space as we're talking about satellites. Ooh, that's rough right there. I I, I haven't had a chance to watch the news today, but I I'd say you know we we have um, uh, JCDC, which is our do joint collaborative, and um the division. This is, I I I'm making up stuff now, but it's a joint collaborative, right? And it's 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 basically you know where where they reach out and 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 have partnerships. Uh, you know I think. There's uh, for for students if they want to come and work with CISA, yeah. we have the SFS uh, you know internship uh, that that allows a, I just hired like eight interns um, you know to to come in and and work for CISA for you know anywhere from the summer to you know into the fall, and I think that's that's also a great experience because he, you know you can bring a lot of research research opportunities. I had. Two uh, PhD students last last semester, and they're they're doing their dissertation on on some of these research topics that we talked about. So uh, you know, there's there's that opportunity, and you know, uh, reach out. You know, reach out to to myself. You know, I I'm I'm always looking for for to to talk to to folks that are willing to talk about technology. You know, um, I, I don't know if you guys have any kind of a technology office here or anything like that, but that, that might be a way to, to kind of reach out to the agency and innovation office or things like that where we can collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's definitely the, the, the way, like, uh, we, like I say, JCDC is, is, is the best way to do it. And I don't know why the, the rest of the name is escaping me. I told you I got my, my wife on my mind right now. I'm scared. Um, <laughs> But we'll we'll survive. <laughs> yeah, give me a doctor's note. That's what that's what I need. That's what I need. Yeah, I need a doctor's note. <laughs> well, I might need a medical doctor after she sees that no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I remember many years ago I, I, I attended some training and then the, the person who was in charge or so he said, and now we'll give you a certificate if you attended this, and then you can show it to your spouse. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is what I'm talking about. See, see, he I know why you marry. He's brilliant. <laughs> well, I thought you this my better half. He's your better half. Before we got married. Oh. Yeah. He's like she's like, oh yeah, okay, don't pull that at home. <laughs> no. Um. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Let me know if you need anything else.